Okay, so um, hello, I'm Ricardo Tomasi. Um, I work at Booking.com, as you already know. And uh, I'm here to talk, talk to you about uh, how we use uh, JavaScript events at Booking. Um, I was told that this audience uh, is very um, technically minded, so I thought I'd go show you a lot of code. <laughs> Hope you don't mind. If you have any questions, please speak up. So um, I want to start by introducing a few concepts uh, to understand uh, what this is about. So first thing is browser events. Who doesn't know what browser events are? <coughs> Nobody? OK, good. So you probably all have seen this, DOM events. When an action happens, you do something. So uh, we have this uh, DOM API, which is the standard event API. You get an element. There's a method called add event listener, uh, to which you give a function, uh, an event name or event type, and a function that will run when, when that event happens. So this is how we do events in the browser. And um, I'm going to expand on this a bit. So we also have custom DOM events. So the browser defines uh, some UI events that are native, so like click, um, mouse over, um, key press, key down, and a uh, uh, hundred others. You can also generate synthetic events. So you, you create an event, you give it a name, like Sparkle, whatever, and uh, you dispatch this event to an element. It will fire like a normal event. So if you have a, a div element and you fire the Sparkle event on it, it will uh, fire in this element. It will bubble up to the down. You can turn that on or off uh, using this API. And what does uh, events give us? They give us loose coupling. So a loosely coupled system is one in which its components have little or no knowledge of the definitions of other separate components. What this means uh, is that you can listen to an event without knowing uh, what's on the other side. So uh, there's a click event, you receive some data, you don't, you don't need to know uh, exactly where that event is coming from. And uh, there's a pattern, pattern called PubSub. Who is familiar with this? Show of hands. OK, a few of you. Uh, yes, who is familiar with PubSub? Yeah, who knows about this? OK, still see the same result. <laughs> so uh, just a few people, so I'm going to explain this uh, more in detail. So PubSub is a pattern. It's a published subscriber pattern or mediator pattern, or also known as using an event bus in a more common language. So. What this is, is instead of getting one object to listen to events that are fired from another object, you have this event bus, which is a, a mediator that uh, receives events and forwards these events to other objects. So you have publishers and you have subscribers. So publishers are objects that uh, publish an event, of course, and uh, the consumers or subscribers receive these events and then do something based on it. And uh, the so the main thing about PubSub, PubSub is that you have a central object that handles all the events. So it receives and it forwards them to the subscribers. I mentioned loose coupling. So when you do this, it means that you can remove subscribers or you can add publishers and the system still works. If you think about uh, DOM events, you need to get the reference to an element first. So find the div, query selector, or using jQuery, and then on some event, do something. This means that you have a reference to that element. If you use a PubSub pattern, you can emit an, an event on the mediator. And uh, if there's no one listening, nothing will happen. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't break. It doesn't throw an error. You don't need to find that specific object, object in, the, in the DOM. Um, so this is the, the normal pattern, not PubSub. You have a publisher. It pu you fire events directly to one object to the other. Um, so here we have a subscriber. This will get a bit complicated, so I'll slow down. Um, we have a subscriber, which is a, a component I'm using, something that is similar to Backbone here. Um, I hope you're all familiar with it. If you're not, you can also uh, raise your hand and ask questions. So I have a component class, which I extend, and it has an init method. This method runs when I create a new class, a new instance. So in this case, I create all of this, and then I need to find the publisher, the object that emits the events, and listen for an event, and then do something. So this thing 
is what uh, makes a difference. I need a reference to the original thing. Whereas in PubSub, you, you get a reference to the mediator and you listen to events from everyone. You don't need to find uh, each object that is finding events. So how do we uh, make use of all this at Booking.com? Uh, first, we'll talk about the past. So we have lots of legacy code at Booking. Uh, Booking was started in 1998, 6, 1996. Um, it's not... I don't think I, haven't, I have seen code from 1996, but uh, definitely from more than 10 years ago. Uh, yes, yeah. So, yeah, we can see 10-year-old ten, ten code still running and still working fine. Uh, so what we used to do until recently, and we still do because uh, we have a huge code base, is not, you can't just change something uh, from... Sorry, it's a bit short. Um, you can change things from the night to day, like it, it takes a while. Uh, so what we used to do is we, have a, we had a global object, which is an instance of jQuery on the window object, so uh, dollar window. I don't know who came up with this idea. Uh, it was probably the easiest way to get something that looks like an event emitter without adding any new code. And uh, at the time this was written, we didn't, there was no uh, Node.js, there was no... Uh, None of the libraries we use today were existed, so uh, it was someone. Yeah, someone had this idea and it worked. So uh, and then you can fire events and you can listen to events on the window object. This works, but it has some issues. Uh, the first issue does, is that not everyone will go to that object to to listen to events. So you can because you're firing stuff on window, you can just go to window and listen to them. And then uh, it means that we have uh, thousands of in instances of uh, event handlers that are impossible to find. You can't grab for them on the code base. You, it's very hard to, to, you have to write a regular expression that finds uh, this expression or, or parse all the JavaScript to find this. Uh, which makes our life uh, a bit complicated. It also has uh, pretty bad performance because jQuery has lots of overhead. It, it has to handle uh, a lot of cross-browser issues. It, it, it does a lot. And then it means it's, it's over 10 times slower than just using a, a standalone uh, Ventimeter implementation. I'll show you what that is later. So in this case, it's a basic benchmark emitting 1,000 events takes 30 milliseconds using the jQuery window uh, object, and it takes two milliseconds using uh, an emitter. It looks uh, like uh, a very short time, but remember that when you want to have a fluid UI, you, don't, you, don't, you want animations to be smooth, you have 16 milliseconds to do stuff, because that's uh, one frame when you have 60 frames per second. And that is something you have to uh, have in mind when you're writing any code. For example, Alejandro mentioned uh, performance on scroll. If you do something that is not very often, are you going to uh, handle 1,000 events at once? But if that happens, then you're going to block uh, the rendering for more than two frames here. And also, jQuery, uh, the jQuery event API has some quirks, which I'm not going to get into detail, but uh, you feel free to ask me about it later. So what he did? is we replace that, or we started replacing that with a standalone event emitter implementation. And we did this first to decouple these events from the DOM. We don't need to emit them on, on window or any object. They're just uh, events which you use to manage the, the, the flow of uh, what happens on the client side. Uh, this gives us better support for object-oriented patterns, like you can make any object emit events or listen to events, which is not the case with jQuery. Um, and we also implemented some strict checks with, which help with um, handling the size of our code base and working with uh, large, large things. So we looked at Node.js, Eventimeter, uh, Eventimeter 2, Eventimeter 3, back, how Backbone does events, and there's a library called Postal.js, which is pretty nice, but uh, a bit overkill for our case. And uh, we ended up writing a new library, which is on GitHub. I'll send you, if you get the slides later, I think we'll be able to do that right? somehow. Uh, then you can uh, visit that and see our implementation. It used, to call be, it used to be called Emmy, but I had to rename it because someone took the package name on NPM. Um, what we wanted is best performance above, uh, among all of these options. So we... Um, 
we have benchmarks, we have uh, lots of performance optimizations that we borrowed from all of these libraries to make sure we're not wasting any time uh, doing uh, work that is not needed. The source is very small, it's uh, two to three hundred lines, lines of code, so anyone can understand what's going on. Uh, unlike diving into jQuery, which uh, if any of you have read the source, it's, uh, it's a nightmare, it's very hard to, to um, navigate that. Uh, we removed namespacing features, which jQuery has, which uh, complicate uh, our life. We have the strict mode, which we'll talk about later. We have some debugging features and also error safe events. Uh, if you're familiar with how events work, if you have, if you had two events, two event handlers, one of them fails, it means the next event doesn't run. It doesn't happen because there was an error. And uh, it might work for most of, most of the time it makes sense because you want to stop an error and, and uh, do something about it. But uh, when you have a, a lot of code on the front end, a lot of, a lot of things happening, and uh, a lot of interaction between, between uh, features and teams, then you don't want uh, Alejandro's uh, error in tracking uh, to break the stop the, the book button from working. So it's, uh, it's a safety feature. And we also have a comprehensive test suite, which uh, all the other frameworks uh, don't really have. Uh, so I'm going to show you some patterns we use at Booking. So we still have a global object, like I showed before, uh, an event bus. You can fire events on it. You can listen to events on it. This is the simplest way to do something with events. You just require the, by the way, uh, do you all know what required us? Who doesn't know what Ricard does? Nobody? Okay, good. So Ricard gets you an instance of uh, a module, an instance of something. So um, basically, this is the, the simplest thing you can do with events. So you emit an event on a global object, and you, you, anyone can listen to that and do something on it when it happens. But this is not ideal long term because of the issues I mentioned before. So we implemented something called the strict events. Uh, basically, you, before you write code, you define all the possible events that can happen. So for example, if you imagine this is uh, something related to search, you have an event that tells you when filters changed, when the sorting changed, so the user clicked the sort uh, bar and changed the sorting order, um, when you want to block updates on UI, on, or when you navigate to a different tab. So what we do here is we define these events. If you try to listen for an event that doesn't exist, you get an error. If you try to send an event that doesn't exist, you get an error. This helps a lot. Uh, we had a re very recent bug where uh, someone added an event listener and, and the name was undefined. Someone else was also listening to an event where the name was undefined. What happens is undefined becomes a string and both of them were triggering and listening on the undefined event with, for two unrelated things. So this will prevent this kind of things from happening. So basically, uh, to use this, you create um, Where's the definition? I think if, yeah, I'm sorry, I missed some part of the code. So you create this, which is a module, module. You create an event emitter, which only accepts these events. When you want to listen to an event, you uh, add an event handler. You use the registered event name, so filter changed here. Search events dot filter changed is a property uh, which is also the string filter changed. So uh, there's only one way to, to listen for this event. And if you want to publish the event, it's the same thing. You can only publish events that are registered. Uh, having a standalone emitter library allows us to do inheritance, so you can turn any object on, into an event emitter. Um, so if you, if you think about uh, React or Backbone or Angular or whatever, let's say you, you create a, uh, how can I mix all of these things? So you create a view or maybe you create a, a, a well, a React component, and that, that thing is an event emitter. It can listen to events, it can send events, and other people can listen to those events. There's also a pattern called listen to, which uh, some of you might have seen in Backbone, uh, if you worked with that. What this does is, instead of going to the other object and saying, uh, object A, on click, do something, where you, have to know, you need to have a reference to that object. You say, uh, I want to listen to this event on this object. And you have a method called stop listening, where you just remove all the events. So 
But instead of going to each object and assigning a new event handler, I can just say remove everything, and then uh, you prevent memory leaks from happening where you add event listeners, you queue your object, but the event listener is still there, so because they live in a separate object. This prevents that. So, for example, we have a component here. You want to listen to UI update, which happens somewhere else. And when you remove this component, you want to remove that listener. You don't need to do remove listener, UI update, something. You just call stop listening, and everything is removed for you. And uh, as I mentioned, we also have a sync events. So uh, this gives us two things. One is the errors I mentioned. The second one is if you do this, so you send an event called data. And later on, you listen for the data event. Usually, with a normal emitter, what will happen is this runs syn synchronously. So emit data will go through all the handlers you have and run that code immediately. When you get here on data, nothing happens because it already fired. When you have an asynchronous event emitter, you, can, you still get the, the first event here. And uh, this, this is something that uh, Node.js also solved in, uh, in a way where you, you create a stream, you start receiving data from, from requests or something, and you, used to lose, you might lose the first, the first packet because uh, you start listening after the event emitter was created. And uh, the second thing is the error. So uh, even if I throw an error here, this one will still run, which is uh, not the case with the normal events. And when in doubt, when in doubt emit an event. What this means is uh, I'll, I'm going to make a reference to A-B testing here. Let's say you have a feature, you want to track something, or you have the light box, and you want to see people who, who are doing something inside the light box, you can just find the code that opens the light box, edit it, and do if track something, um, call tracking, or do anything else, anything else you want. Um, if you start doing that all the time, and you have hundreds of developers doing that, uh, your code uh, becomes quite a mess. So, what we do is, whenever you can, emit an event. So these events will work like a hook. So I want to do something when the user clicks the sign-in button. There's a, an event for the sign-in button. So you don't need to find the code that actually handles that and, and insert, uh, write new code inside that, add lots of conditions. You just listen for that event. You run your experiment. If nothing, if it fails, you can just remove that code, which is in a separate file, uh, and you don't need to clean up anything inside. So this this is uh, good for scaling. Like if you have, uh, if you're doing lots of things on one code base, you don't want to be uh, modifying the source of everything all the time. You add events, you add hooks everywhere. You create a new file that plugs into those hooks. You do something, and if you want to remove it, you just remove it. No, nothing, nothing will fail if you remove that. Yeah, that's a very good example. For if you have events, because you can plug stuff and they they are not dependent on each other, you can add uh, debugging. You can add uh, several features that you only want to happen on specific occasions. So you can plug that in. You can disable it, and and uh, it's like switching on and off. You don't need to change any other code. So the other things we're looking at: Flux. Some of you might have heard of it from Facebook. Uh, Flux is basically an, a pattern to how to handle events, I will not go into detail here because it's, uh, we don't have enough time. But um, if you think about the PubSub uh, graph I showed before, like it looks like events are only going one way, but in reality you can have objects that are both uh, publishers and subscribers, so you can, they both listen to events they, and they emit events. Uh, when you start having lots of objects in your code doing that, it, it, can be uh, quite complicated to, to figure out what is happening. So um, when this happens, the whole chain of events that fire 
uh, is, is very hard to reason about and Flux helps with that. It defines um, basically an architecture where you events only flow in one way. You always know what, what's going on. Uh, you can visit that link to, to read more about it. We also have a halfway solution for that, which is to avoid having local state in components. Instead, you save everything to one object. I have some examples here. So uh, let's say you have a date picker. When you change the date, you save the, the current date as a property of that object. So this check-in date equals uh, input value or something. And then you send an event saying, check-in changed. And then someone else can say, OK, uh, check-in date changed. Let, let's reload the search results or do something like that. This would be the, the normal way. Uh, but then what it means is, uh, let's say, Clicking on the date picker and changing the date is not the only way you can change the date. Uh, let's say you have um, some other thing where there are some date restrictions. You click it, and then it changes your check-in to, to uh, a day before or a day after. And then you have to keep off this in sync. You need to make sure that that check-in date was changed here in this component. And you need to make, that the, make sure that the event fires the right check-in date, not the previous one, because now you have two things that are uh, defining what the check-in date is. So you have multiple sources of truth. What, what you do is we turn this into a stateless thing. You, uh, you have a global star where you set the check-in date. And you never, you never save this locally here. You always emit an event with no data. If anyone wants to get the check-in date, you listen to that event. When that event happens, you get the, you get the data from the store. So you never save anything on, on separate objects. We, you might have hundreds of com UI components on the page. They are saved to one object. And uh, you, see, you see this uh, as a recommendation if you work with React sometimes. The, it, it's, uh, it depends on your application, but it's a good pattern to use. Uh, we are testing uh, actual Flux implementation uh, right now, not in production, but uh, some guys are working on it. And um, it looks good so far. And we're also looking at custom DOM events. I mentioned we just moved away from uh, using DOM events. But uh, if you think of the way React works, like you have nested components, and uh, you can uh, listen to events, or you can actually assign handlers to uh, something inside your components. So I don't know. You have a search box. You have multiple inputs. You have the search button of these are components. Um, the only way to make sure that you know where those, these events are coming from. So you have, uh, if, if you have two search boxes on the page, you want to know which button was pressed. If you emit one event, like a search button clicked, you don't know which search box was used. So by firing that event on the element that was clicked and, and uh, bubbling it up to down, you can capture it on the, the um, parent component. And then you can handle that in a, in a more uh, organized way. So yeah, it's kind of going backwards, but uh, we're still um, finding our way through, through this. Uh, as I said, it's a huge code base. We have how many uh, developers? Uh, how many developers in front end? Yeah, yeah. 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 100. 100, yeah, probably a bit more right now. Yeah, if you want to increase that number. So yeah, <laughs> So that's it, I hope, yeah. It was uh, quite heavy, sorry. <laughs> I hope uh, it was understandable. If you have any questions, uh, speak up. We'll also be at uh, drinks later, uh, but hopefully no one will want to talk about events in detail <laughs> during drinks. Questions? Oh, OK.